Hey everybody and welcome back to our lecture series and for this lecture we're going to look at the Taft Court. Uh, so to begin with uh, let's just do our, our customary recap and discuss and do a, a quick uh, discussion on what we spoke about in our last lecture. So in our last lecture we looked at the 1920s. Uh, the 1920s was an, uh, a time and era in which uh, the United in which the America as we know uh, the contemporary United States was the foundation of which was uh, was being laid. Um, we looked at prohibition, how it was um, really this uh, the last real thrust from the progressive movement um, to to uh, to be um, f uh, finally passed. Uh, the Nineteenth Amendment. Um, outlawing the manufacture, sale, or consumption of alcoholic beverages, uh, with the exception of uh, Roman Catholics, of course. Catholics were allowed to to, uh, to still drink wine, of course, only during communion. Um, but prohibition itself sort of uh, backfired. It did not have the the moral or the, um, the, the social impact that uh, those who campaigned for it uh, had hoped. Um, prohibition led to one a casual disregard for laws, uh, particularly federal law. Uh, prohibition also led to a uh, a marked a increase in organized crime. Uh, figures such as Al Capone became uh, uh, became nationally notorious um, for their uh, for their exploits. Uh, Capone for his ruthless takeover of the Chicago. Uh, prohibition, um, uh, a, a trade, um, trade in uh, illegal alcohol, uh, and prohib prohibition also allowed for many uh, uh, members of uh, the immigrant communities, uh, many members who were uh, who have been condemned to the lower echelons of society to make it to uh, to fully become members of the American middle class and to be accepted into that middle class. Um, we also looked at the Scopes trial, and the Scopes trial was just um, another instance in which we see this widening gap, this wide gulf emerging between uh, those who live in urban, urban and suburb, uh, suburban settings and those who still lived in rural areas. Um, the Scopes trial, of course, centered on the teaching of uh, evolution, and one uh, Tennessee teacher, John Scopes, violation of a state law outlawing the teaching of evolution. Um, it also is uh, famous for this uh, uh, quite memorable uh, exchanges and back and forth between Clarence Darrow who represented John Scopes and William Jennings Bryan who decided to uh, represent the state of Tennessee in this matter. Um, uh, Darrow uh, thoroughly embarrassed, really thrashed uh, Jennings in their debates, uh, but it was all, um, but there wasn't any any real animosity between the parties, um, and this is evidenced by the fact that Jennings had, um, uh, not Jennings, Brian, sorry, uh, William Jennings Bryan, Bryan had offered to pay the fine of John Stopes, uh, and it, but it still marked uh, a, a social change a noticeable cho uh, social change in the republic and uh, and lastly we looked at women and women made tremendous gains um from uh the revolutionary act of bobbing their hair to smoking in public to new access to jobs all on their own um a very exciting very dynamic time for some not really uh for everybody uh but we'll get into um to that in our in our next lecture, when we re-examine everything that happened in the 1920s, um, as for now, uh, the lecture at hand is an examination of the Taft Court. Um, and let me just say that by the beginning of the 1920s, the United States gained an air of economic prosperity and political stability. Had the middle class grew and were delighted by the new and intriguing consumer goods such as radios, vacuums, and Model Ts. Uh, during this decade, the content of voters placed three conservative Republican presidents in the White House, Warren Harding, Calvin Coolidge, and Herbert Hoover. Now, these three were politically conservative and placed conservative-minded justices on the Supreme Court. Uh, between them, they named eight justices to the Supreme Court, 
all of whom were, were uh, Republican. The most prominent and uh, most influential was former President William Howard Taft, who sat as Chief Justice between 1921 and 1930. During his single term in office, uh, Taft himself had placed six justices on the Supreme Court, uh, including his predecessor, Edward White. Uh, Taft, who was a lawyer and judge before his political career, made no secret regarding his desire to be uh, not just a justice on the court, but the chief justice of the Supreme Court. Taft was a conservative who was staunchly, uh, who... Uh, staunchly stood by and charismatically wooed others to his position. Uh, he had a very conservative economic and social views. Uh, Taft was also a devotee to the rule of law and determined to shape the court in a into a very powerful institution in American politics. On the Taft court, the liberal justices were, uh, were, were typically uh, outvoted and outnumbered. Now, Oliver Wyndham Holmes and Louis Brandeis, uh, who joined uh, in 1925, um, they were joined in 1925 by Harlan Fisk Stone. Uh, now, Stone had previously served as the attorney under uh, the attorney general under Calvin Coolidge, and Stone came to national prominence when he was charged with cleaning up the Justice Department after the Teapot Dome scandal. Uh, they were outed. Um, they, they, uh, they were outvoted uh, and really outmaneuvered by Chief Justice Taft and his four conservative allies, uh, Willis Van uh, DeVanter, uh, James McReynolds, George Sutherland, and Pierce Butler. Uh, these four justices became known as the four horsemen of reaction during Franklin Roosevelt's administration. And the chief, uh, the chief cases of the Taft Court were free speech cases. In 1919, the court heard a case involving socialists and anarchists who, who had opposed the, the government, uh, who had opposed the government policies during World War One. Uh, the defendants in the next three uh, cases belonged to the Communist Party, and uh, and they were supported uh, by the Bolshevik Party back in Russia. Now, the Communist Party had in fact been formed had a splinter group of Socialist Party members who uh, refused to adhere to the Socialist policy of gradually uh, gaining membership um, and the means of production uh, and, and by running uh, candidates for public office. The Communist Party rejected cooperation with the capitalists and sought to recreate the revolution on the, uh, on the Russian model. Now this prompted uh, this prompted the federal government to round up more than 400 aliens uh, where, um, where, where they were deported. Um, one communist leader, Benjamin Gitlow, was singled out in New York and was charged with criminal anarchy, advocating a doctrine that called for a sitting government to be overthrown by force or violence. And Gitlow, uh, Gitlow had uh, distributed copies of the Left Wing Manifesto. Um, now that uh, recalcitrant uh, socialists adopted uh, before forming the Communist Party back in 1919. Now the tactics that Gitlow was um, hand now the other tracks, uh, and the tactics used by Gitlow all um, all called on workers to conquer the power of the state um, by revolutionary mass action. It also disavowed any calls for an immediate revolution and stated that the final battle against capitalism may last for years. Uh, Gitler was arrested and he was sent to a prison term of five years. Now, uh, Charlotte Whitney. Charlotte Whitney was a member of a very prominent California family and the niece of a, a former associate justice, Stephen Field, who incidentally was on the courts, uh, with one of the court's most uh, leading conservative members in the 19th century. Um, Whitney was a social organizer and spent much of her adult life attached to various charitable causes such as fighting poverty. Uh, she joined the Communist Labor Party in 1919, a breakaway from the Communist Party that supported the electoral process in the class struggle. Uh, Whitney was convicted under California's criminal syndication law 
for her advocacy of crime, sabotage, and unlawful methods of terrorism had the means of affecting uh, political change. And Whitney was sentenced to 1 to 14 years in prison. Um, now both Gitlow and uh, Whitney appealed to the Supreme Court and the court agreed to hear the Gitlow case in 1925 and sent Whitney's case back to the California courts. Now an interesting feature in both uh, cases is that the defense lawyers did not base their appeals on the uh, free speech clause of the First Amendment. Uh, that provision only applied to acts of Congress and both Gitlow and Whitney had been convicted of violating state laws. In 1833, the Supreme Court had ruled that the provisions of the Bill of Rights did not apply to the states, uh, and, and this decision was made in Barron v. Baltimore. Now, Gitlow's lawyers argued that the state had deprived him of its right to liberty, had to find under the Due Process Clause of the 14th Amendment. Um, the opinion had earlier uh, struck down laws that violated the right to make contracts under the Liberty Clause. Um, in a 7-2 decision, the justices upheld the conviction. Uh, Associate Justice Edward Stanford wrote the majority opinion in which Stanford conceded that the record showed no public effect from the publication of the manifesto, but argued that New York State's uh, policing powers to protect the public um, from revolutionary speech uh, alone without any effect from its utterance was now punishable. Um, to quote Stanford, a single revolutionary spark may kindle a fire uh, that smoldering for a time may burst into a sweeping and, destruction, uh, and destructive conflagration. Stanford, in his opinion, continued, uh, freedom of speech and of the press which are protected from abridgment by Congress are among the fundamental personal rights and liberties protected uh, by the Due Process Clause of the 14th Amendment against impairment by the states. With this sentence, uh, the court began the process of incorporating the Bill of Rights into the 14th Amendment. Um, the earlier case of Barron v. Baltimore established a limit on enforcement of the Bill of Rights limiting it to the federal government and leaving the states free to restrict the rights of, of, uh, of uh, citizens that they saw fit with impunity. What the Gitlow case initiated was a reversal of that, beginning a trend towards its near complete uh, reversal. Now, the Supreme, Court, uh, the Supreme Court now holds that almost every provision of the Bill of Rights applied to both federal and uh, state law. The advocates of a corporation, um, it, it only made sense to have the state and federal government be held accountable to the same standard, while detractors state that it is an unwanted uh, and unmerited intrusion by the federal government into the affairs of the states. Uh, the doctrine had uh, held that, and uh, the doctrine had and still has had serious consequences. Uh, most of the challenges to the provision of the Bill of Rights stems from, uh, from, from state statutes. Um, the incorporation doctrine gave the court the right to review and strike down these laws. The Stanford opinion, um, the, the, uh, the, the, uh, the, the decision to include this, uh, this jab passed almost unnoticed, not by the papers of the day, nor was it reported or made uh, any mention of um, by, by reporters uh, in, in, uh, in, in the years immediately following. Now in 1927, the court finally heard Charlotte Whitney's case. Uh, Stanford again wrote for the court in a unanimous ruling that quoted the previous uh, opinion from the Gitlow case. Whitney had not made any utterances. However, her crime was belonging to a communist group with revolutionary aims. Stanford stated that Whitney by her membership became part of a criminal conspiracy. Under the ruling, any member of a communist uh, or uh, other group uh, became subject to criminal prosecution. Brandeis and Holmes joined the uh, majority reluctantly and Brandeis wrote, fear of serious injury cannot alone justify suppression of free speech and assembly. Uh, men feared witches and burnt women. Uh, it is the function of speech to free men 
from the bondage of irrational fears to justify suppression of free speech uh, there must be reasonable ground to fear that serious evil will result if free speech is practice um, there must be reasonable ground to believe that the danger apprehended is imminent uh, there must be reasonable ground to believe that the evil to be prevented is a serious one these two opinions provoked widespread criticism from liberal and conservative political leaders. In 1927, the fears of a Soviet-like revolution had subsided, and both Gislow and Whitney were pardoned by their respective state governors. Uh, now, um, that that those two cases were among the more prominent, but by no means were they the only major cases to be heard or um, or tried during the. Uh, the, the Taft uh, case. Um, other cases, uh, uh, in particular, three other cases. The the case of uh, Mayor v. Nebraska, Adkins v. Children's Hospital, and Pierce v. Society of Sisters, which we had already looked at earlier in our examination of the 1920s. Um, in in the in the case of Adkins v. Children's Hospital. Um, a, a, a case came before the court in 1923. Uh, now, Congress had created and passed law for the District of Columbia and had created a wage board to set uh, a minimum wage of $71.50 a month for women. Now, the board based its price on, fooding, on, uh, on food, housing, clothing, and uh, other pricing in the District of Columbia. Uh, these findings and figures were challenged by Children's Hospital, who filed a suit against Jesse Adkins, who, does, uh, who chaired the, uh, the wage board. Um, the, the hospital argued that the minimum wage laws were not designed to protect the health of the women. Now, the court held that the minimum wage laws were not designed to protect the health of workers, like the maximum hours law in the Mueller case. Uh, Felix Frankfurter. Felix Frankfurter was hired to defend the wage board. Uh, he was a Harvard Law professor, and Frankfurter's argument was dismissed as interesting but only mildly persuasive by Associate Justice George Sutherland. Frankfurter's argument was rejected in a 5-3 decision that saw the conservative justices champion the liberty of contract doctrine. Uh, now, Sutherland... Uh, Sutherland also cited the 19th Amendment, in which he stated had brought the difference between the sexes almost to the vanishing point. Sutherland's opinion was so reactionary that Chief Justice Taft dissented uh, and argued that there was no distinction between minimum wage laws and maximum hour laws, since both were essentially restrictions on contract. Um, this case... Uh, was followed by Mayor v. Nebraska. And, and Mayor v. Nebraska was a challenge to a Nebraska state law that prohibited the teachings uh, of students below um, uh, below uh, the ninth grade in any other language other than English for public or private schools. Uh, the Nebraska state legislature had passed the, the law in 1919 in a fit of wartime hostility against ethnic Germans. Now a teacher named Robert Mayer uh, was convicted and fined uh, for assigning a book of Bible stories that was written in German to a student in a Lutheran school. Um, the Nebraska State Supreme Court agreed that the legislature uh, agreed with the legislature that it was baneful to allow foreigners to rear and educate their children uh, in their foreign language. The Supreme Court uh, disagreed with the asso uh, an associate justice uh, McReynolds wrote uh, the majority opinion uh, in which he uh, cited the Lochner and the Atkins decision to support his position. Um, that the liberty protected by the 14th Amendment applied not only to contracts but also to acquire youthful knowledge uh, and also uh, to bring up children. Um, the Nebraska law was struck down has violated the due process clause of the 14th amendment um, and, and as we had already seen uh, in the case of Pierce versus Society of, Sister, uh, of Sisters the Oregon State Legislature had passed a law that required parents to send their children to public schools um, the law was the result of the 
newly revived Ku Klux Klan uh, and was aimed at the local Catholic schools. The resurgent Klan became a major political force throughout the Republican year in the 1920s. Uh, the Oregon State Governor Walter Pierce, uh, he did not support the Klan and he ordered the Attorney General not to defend the law. The Oregon Supreme Court struck it down as an infringing upon the liberty of parents um, to direct their children's education. Uh, the Oregon, um, the Oregon legislature really, the, no one really in, in Oregon um, uh, really, really cared to, uh, to challenge that. But Oregon did appeal the decision to the Supreme Court, which upheld the Oregon State Supreme Court ruling. Uh, and it's really unfortunate for, uh, for Pierce. Uh, Pierce did not like the law. He did all he could to help suppress the law, to help get it um, struck down. Um, kind of unfortunate that his name, because he was the governor, uh, gets attached to it, get, gets attached to this case. Now, uh, when the court, when the Supreme Court struck down this ruling, it was again Justice McReynolds who wrote for a unanimous court in Pierce v. Uh, Society of Sisters, which relied on his own opinion, um, in uh, relied on his own opinion in the Myers case. Now, the Taft Court's decision uh, in Whitney, Gitlow, and Atkins. Um, reflect uh, the views of the conservative majority that dominated the court during these years. But the decisions in Mayer and Pierce uh, can be called liberal for affirming the rights of the individual citizen against the powers of the state. Uh, there are also standouts because the court's most conservative member, um, Justice uh, McReynolds, wrote the decisions in both those uh, those liberal cases. So, so it's the, the Taft Court uh, was really just kind of interesting. Uh, but that'll do it. That, that'll wrap up our lecture on the, the Taft Court, on the, um, the Supreme Court during the, uh, the 1920s. Uh, as always, hit like, subscribe, and comment. Let me know what you thought about this, uh, these cases. Let me know what you thought about the Taft Court. And I'll see you guys next time for another lecture.